Turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. I'll be reading the first 10 verses of Colossians chapter 2. Hear now this reading of God's holy, infallible, and inerrant word. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, Rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. As you, therefore, have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. <clears throat> See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him... All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful for our great Savior. Who is indeed our all-sufficient Savior. We ask, Father, that you would, by your Spirit, give us understanding of this text. We ask also, Father, that you would abundantly bless the proclamation of your Word with the power of the Spirit working in in and through the preacher. We also pray for the power of the Spirit to work in those who hear this message this morning. We ask that this would be a time of your power, a time where we sense you working within us. And Father, we ask that we would None of us leave this place unaffected by the preaching of your word. We ask this in the name of our precious Savior. Amen. There was a pastor who was conducting a series of meetings uh, in several churches in North Carolina and South Carolina. And... He was staying with close friends in Asheville and then traveling each night to wherever he was going to go off to preach. One night he was scheduled to preach in Greenville, just down the road from you. Um, so some friends in Greenville offered to drive up to Asheville and to pick him up and carry him to the meeting uh, there in Greenville. And after that meeting, he stayed after for some fellowship and then he rode back to the host's house back in Asheville. And he gets to the house. He's at the bottom of the drive. And uh, the porch light's on. He expects his host to be up. So he 
gets out of the car and sends his driver on his way. Well, it was winter. And he felt the bitter cold that night as he walked up the long driveway. And by the time he got on the porch, his nose and his ears were already numb. He taps on the door. No response. He taps a little louder. No response. Concerned about the intense cold, he goes around to the side of the house, taps on the kitchen door. No response. Taps on the window, the side window. No response. He's getting colder and colder by the second. He decides the best thing for him to do is try to find a public phone so he can call his host. So he starts walking. He didn't know the area well at all, and he walked for several miles. And walking along the road, he slipped and slid down a bank into about two feet of water. Well, he crawls back up to the road. He's cold. He's soaked. He continues down the road, and finally he sees a blinking motel light. He's able to wake the motel manager and uses the phone, and so he calls his host. The pastor is now frustrated, soaked, nearly frozen, very exhausted, and when he calls, he Hears his sleepy voice, I mean the voice of his host, a sleepy, I'll get it, the voice of his sleepy host. And he explains that he had tried to get someone to wake up in the house, but he failed. He couldn't get anybody to wake up. Well, the host replies, my friend. You have a key in your overcoat pocket. Don't you remember? I gave you the key before you left. So the pastor reaches into his overcoat pocket. And what do you suppose he found? The key to the house. Many Christians have serious problems. They go through a lot of aggravation and frustration, trying to solve their problems on their own, not realizing that they already possess the key. And that key is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He alone is able to fulfill the deepest longings of your heart and to supply every spiritual resource you need to advance in your Christian life. In these first 10 verses of Colossians chapter 1, we see here the Apostle Paul pointing us to the sufficiency of Christ. What this text shows is that Christ's sufficiency is demonstrated in Paul's struggle for believers. Verses 1 through 3. And then we see Christ's sufficiency demonstrated in Paul's concern for believers. Verses 4 through 8. And then Christ's sufficiency demonstrated in Paul's declaration of the believer's completeness in Christ. Look how the, the Apostle Paul begins. He says that he has this great struggle for these Colossian believers, also believers in Laodicea and others who have not met him. This struggle that he has is in the area of prayer. The word here that's translated struggle gives the impression of a very agonizing struggle. 
something he's dealing with and it's weighing heavily upon his heart. We learn in verse 2, what are the things that he's concerned about for these believers? What is he agonizing over? What is he praying for them? Well, it's it's important for us to realize that the reason why Paul is concerned about these believers is because of false teachers that have come to Colossae. Apparently their pastor, Epaphras, we read about him in chapter 1, verse 7, the pastor of the congregation went all the way to Rome to seek out Paul while he was in prison to explain what these false teachers were teaching. And once Paul gets news of that, now he has this struggle. Now he has this conflict in his heart and he's praying for these believers. And let me say up front, Even though the specific problem that Paul is addressing in this text, the sufficiency of Christ goes far beyond the teaching of those false teachers. Goes far beyond that. Understand that as we work through the text because one of the things you need to leave today with is an understanding that Christ is indeed your all-sufficient Savior. Everything that you need, He's the resource for satisfying and taking care of that need. The first thing that we can see in verse 2 is that He desires, what He's praying for is that their hearts would be encouraged having been knit together in love. There is a need for God's people to be encouraged. Would you not agree? All the time. But we can think about the particular circumstance that Paul is dealing with here because when false teachers come in, you may remember when the new perspective shows up. The federal vision shows up. What was the tendency? What's the tendency anytime there's false teaching within the church? There is a tendency for there to be suspicions, alienation, and turmoil. Because one brother wonders if this other brother has been contaminated, and that brother may be wondering if this other one's been contaminated. And so there's distrust among the congregation. Everyone's careful about what they say and how they say it. Why? Because there's now a tendency to over-scrutinize everything that's said, every expression, and every action. These believers needed to be encouraged by what? Mutual love. Mutual love. But then he moves on. He says, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. I know that's a mouthful. He's desiring now for them to attain to spiritual wealth. And we'll see in a moment how that's connected to their encouragement through mutual love. The point that Paul makes, first of all, as this is that this wealth, notice what he says, the wealth that comes from full assurance of understanding. That wealth comes from full assurance of understanding. And it's particularly, and I should also point out, the full assurance comes from understanding itself. That's the relationship between the full assurance and the understanding is that understanding is what brings about the full assurance. Are you fully convinced that what you believe is true? Are you fully convinced that what you believe is true? 
Because if you don't, I might as well close the message and we all go home. Not really, I'm sure some of you do firmly believe, are fully convinced that what you believe is true. And that that full assurance comes from your understanding. But notice how he goes on. Resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ. Resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ. We need to make sure that when we read the word mystery in the Bible, that we don't think it's expressing something more like the idea of a riddle or something that's difficult to understand. That's the English understanding, usually, of the word mystery. The word mystery is used in the Bible to express the idea of a secret that is revealed to a specific group of people. That's what the apostle means here. There's a secret that we as God's people enjoy. And guess what? It's a secret that we want to share with others. We don't want to keep it secret. We better not want to keep it secret. But again, this is talking about a special revelation that's given to God's people. Yes, the, the mystery is about the Lord Jesus. Now, this use of the word mystery suggests that Paul is using this term to oppose these false teachers. The false teachers were undoubtedly claiming to possess I couldn't think of a better way of putting it. Insider information. Insider information. See, they, they claim that we have these mysteries. We have these secrets that God has revealed to us. And if you just listen to us, if you just listen to us, then you're going to grow as a Christian. No, it's not the false teachers who had the insider information, we as Christians, we as believers, have the insider information. And we need that information because we need to understand the mystery. We need to understand this mystery. We need that full knowledge that true knowledge of this mystery who is Christ himself. Look at verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The word here that's translated hidden probably has the idea of stored up. In him is stored up all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, I want you to listen now because I'm going to give you what Paul is saying in reverse chronological order. You may say, what? I think if I do this, you will realize what Paul is seeking to accomplish. And one of the things I've found so often in Paul, he does give things in a reverse chronological order. So let me sum this up for, for you. First, by drawing on the resources you have in Christ, you gain knowledge and then understanding of the mystery of Christ the understanding produces full assurance, full assurance along with mutual love encourages your heart. Did you get that? Now, maybe you didn't. I'm not sure the first time I went through this, I got it. But you might want to just maybe meditate on the flow of thought here. It begins with Christ 
And it ends with your heart being encouraged. If you get that much, then you got something very important. You see, false teachers, what do they want to do? They want to draw true believers away from the Christ of genuine Christianity. But is it only false teachers that tend to do that? Aren't there worldly enticements that tend to do that? Aren't there things that appeal to our flesh? Aren't there things that would also draw us away from Christ? One of the reasons why so many go off into the cults is because of spiritual ignorance but also because there's a lack of a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, Paul's desire is for these believers to attain to this spiritual wealth that he mentions in the middle of verse 2. And then he gives them that great source. Listen to this again, verse 3. In whom are hidden all, should I say that again? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That all is, dare I say it, all inclusive. You need your Savior. You need to draw on the wealth that you have in your Savior, not just when there's a tendency for false teaching to show up, but any time that you're discouraged, any time that you're tempted to be drawn away from Christ, any time that you recognize that you have a spiritual weakness, a spiritual need, might even be something like worry. Does anybody here never worry? If, if that's true, I'd like to speak to you after the, that. Sir, Christ is your all in all. That's how Paul ends those first three verses. He is pointing these believers to their all sufficient Savior. But then we go on in verses four through eight, where we can see that Christ's sufficiency is demonstrated in Paul's concern for these believers. Notice verse 4. Now this I, excuse me, I say this in order that no one may delude you with persuasive argument. Even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. So first of all, Paul is concerned that there may be someone who would deceive them. Someone might deceive them or delude them as the New American Standard has <coughs> to delude them. This means to deceive by false reasoning. I have relatives that are Jehovah's Witnesses. And I know what their tactics are. They try to mix enough evangelical truth to what they're teaching that they can make you think, oh, well, they must have the truth. And so they pull you into their air. Now, some of, them, some of you know who I'm going to be talking about, but I'm not going to mention his name. But there's a well-known person who once said that the best lie is the one that's closest to the truth. Anybody ever hear that one? The best lie is the one that's closest to the truth. Heterodoxy that is close to orthodoxy is the worst kind of heterodoxy. You understand what I'm saying? Mixing truth with error. This is what the cults tend to do. Mix truth with error. You know how farmers kill rats on the farm, don't you? They don't put out rat poison and expect the rats to come along and eat it. They mix 
a little bit of poison with some really good grain. See, people say, you know this. They come along with what they're there to do. They're, those rats are going to eat that good grain. But it's the poison that kills them. That's how the cults work. You need to saturate your minds with the truth of Christ revealed in the scriptures. I guess you know how federal agents are trained to spot counterfeit bills. They don't study the counterfeit bills. They study intensely genuine bills. They go over those bills over and over again so that when a phony bill crosses their eyes, they immediately recognize it because they have spent so much time studying the genuine article. We need to keep our focus on Christ. Paul shows that he's concerned that someone might deceive or delude these believers. He's concerned that there might be the use of persuasive arguments. There at the end of verse 4, these persuasive arguments uh, refer to teaching that's false and it fascinates the mind. So often, the novelty of a heresy can be appealing. So often, the charm of rhetoric can lead someone astray and then appeal to, should I say it, so called scholarship can also be persuasive. We need to be on our guard. I find it interesting that Paul talks about in verse 5 that even though he's absent with them in body, he's present with them in spirit. This is, was actually a fairly common <coughs> expression in Paul's day. The idea here is that he's with them mentally, he's with them emotionally. But I also find it striking what he says in, in the second part of verse 5. Rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith. Paul is not addressing a weak congregation. It's a strong congregation. Like I imagine this congregation is. But constant vigilance is necessary for a strong congregation to re retain its spiritual strength. But notice as we go on, Paul is concerned not only that someone may delude them or deceive them, he was concerned that they may not continue to walk in Christ. He takes this all the way down to verse 7. Notice how he begins. As you therefore. We'll come back to the therefore. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. So walk in him. The therefore is showing us that he's connecting this next section to the preceding section, verses 1 through 4, I mean 1 through 5. He makes it clear that in order for them to withstand the attempts of these false teachers to, de to deceive them, what he has written in those first five verses, but particularly verse 3 where he talks about in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, he is giving them the basis for what? Being on their guard against the deception. And, and that continues on by how they walk in Christ. That's the first point. So walk in Christ. And in the Greek, in him is thrown emphatically in front of the verb. So it's literally, so in him walk. As you go through this text, as we go through the text, notice how many times he says, in him, in him, in him. 
And the first way in which they are to walk is as they have received Christ. I like the way Calvin put it. For in these words he admonishes them <coughs> that they must adhere to the doctrine which they had embra embraced as delivered to them by Epaphras with so much constancy as to be on their guard against every other doctrine and faith in accordance to what Isaiah said, this is the way, walk ye in it. A very well-known Greek grammarian, a Reformed Baptist, I should add, he's with the Lord, he's been with the Lord a long time, but he summarized it this way, stick to your first lessons in Christ. Anything that would contradict that they had been taught about Christ, they weren't to listen to it. But then he goes on. Not only are they to walk as they receive Christ, they are to walk being rooted in him. In verse 7, <coughs> having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him, the in him goes with both being rooted in Christ I mean, it goes with both Christ and build, being built up. <coughs> we have here this imagery of being rooted in Christ. I believe the metaphor here is that of a tree. When we think about roots, the roots of a tree, what's one of the main purposes of a root? It's to draw sustenance. It's to draw sustenance. Being rooted in Christ. We are to draw our spiritual life from him. But roots also provide, and because of that sustenance, the roots then provide growth and stability for the tree. It's a way of expressing the believer's vital union with Christ. But then he goes on to the building motif. Being built up in him. This is just another way of emphasizing the need for growth and stability. And this growth and stability is the result of being rooted in Christ and being built up in him. Next, they are to walk being established in their faith. Now, actually, the first three ways in which he's told them they need to walk, this would be the way then that they would be enabled to walk established in the faith. In other words, if they walk as they have received Christ, if they walk being rooted and grounded in Christ, if they walk being built up in Christ, then indeed they would walk being established in the faith. <coughs> but then you come to the last one. How are they also to walk? Overflowing with gratitude. Overflowing with gratitude. Are you overflowing with gratitude? Are you? I think some of you might be. Hopefully all of you. But if you're not, if you're not overflowing with gratitude, perhaps it's because you are not walking as you should in Christ. Follow the sequence that the apostle gives here. Notice how it ends. With hearts overflowing. With How could they not overflow with gratitude? <clears throat> when we realize our sufficiency in Christ. If we are walking as we should in Christ. How can we not then walk in gratitude? overflowing with gratitude. 
But then Paul comes to verse 8. Because he now commands them to be on their guard. The word here that's translated, take you captive, see to it that no one takes you captive. The idea really here is to take, is to carry away as a captive. It's a little bit more of a picture there of the believers are here. They're taken captive and carried away. Carried away from who? Christ. From Christ. They were to be on their guard against philosophy, baseless, empty speculation. They were to be on their guard against empty <coughs> deception. That describes a philosophy that claims to be true but is utterly deceitful. It's like a fisherman who captures its prey by concealing a deadly hook with a rubber worm. The fish thinks it's getting a meal, but becomes one instead. Against the tradition of men. They're warned to be on their guard against the tradition of men. I don't know how many times... I've heard somebody say, this is the will of God. This is what we should be doing. You must be doing this. You must be doing that. And the thing that keeps running through my mind as they're saying this is, where do you find that in the Bible? Where do you find that? What's the basis for this? And I don't think it's because I missed something. Even in Reformed circles, we have to be on our guard against the traditions of men. One of the things I love about this church, you're very reformed in your worship. Very, very much um, aware of the regulative principle. But it's interesting, he goes on and talks about how they need to be careful about the elementary principles of the word world. The word here is translated elementary principles. Um, there's a lot of speculation of what this word means. I won't go into all that. The word originally re referred to the alphabet, the Greek alphabet. And a lot of times it's used for just introductory, basic teaching. Uh, have you ever heard somebody talk about the ABCs of this and the ABCs of that? You know, when you're talking about just the basics of a particular um, study, um, particular bit of information. See, I believe that... Paul is using this term in a very derogatory sense. I believe that Paul is implying that these false teachers want these Christians to learn in their kindergarten. And Paul is seeking to convince these believers, no, you need to stay in the college of Christ. Don't listen to these men that want to take you to Kindergarten, stay in the college of Christ. But notice how he comes to the end of verse 8. And he says, rather than according to Christ. Rather than according to Christ. He is saying that what you hear, what you are taught needs to be according to Christ. Paul recognizes that the heresy that was being promoted at Colossae was contrary to the person, work, and teaching of Christ. He wanted the church at Colossae to understand that its existence, well-being, and instruction are in Christ, are according to Christ. And so he ends this next section by pointing these believers again <coughs> to the sufficiency of Christ. And then in verses 9 and 10, we <coughs> see that Christ's sufficiency is demonstrated in Paul's declaration of the believer's completeness in Christ. This, this section has, or this 
text, verse 10, first 10 verses, basically has three seconds. And the way Paul sets things up, it reminds me of how a carpenter drives a nail. What, how does that typically happen? Tap. He gives it a firm tap into the wood. And then he raises the hammer and drives in one powerful blow to the nail. And then he rears back and he drives it home. Now, if you're a carpenter and you can do it in two, that's okay. We can talk about that after the service. You get my point. I think that Paul here is driving home his great point in this last of what we're considering. Two things here. Your completeness in Christ, or as we'll see, your fullness in Christ is based on two things. Christ's deity and his sovereignty. Actually, the two go together. If he's God, and he is, then he's sovereign. But look at how He puts this together. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. The and at the beginning of verse 10 really should have, we need to understand it has the idea of and therefore, In him, you have been made complete. You get the connection. That's the sense. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily translated, have been made complete, share the same root in the Greek. It gives a stronger connection between verses 9 and 10. The sense is this. That Christ possesses the fullness of deity, and therefore you are made complete in him. That's the sense. The NIV actually does a good job of making this connection. It reads, for in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. They understood the connection between the noun and the verb there. But notice how he ends verse 10. Now the New American Standard reads, and he is. Actually in the Greek it's a relative pronoun. It should read this way. Who is the head over all rule and authority? A lot of times relative Pronouns in Greek, but also we find this in English, have the idea of what we call a causative idea. The sense here is, in him you have been made complete because he is head over all rule and authority. And with this understanding, we see that your completeness in Christ Your fullness in Christ is also then based on his sovereignty. In this text, we have seen how Christ's sufficiency is demonstrated in Paul's struggle for believers. How his sufficiency is demonstrated in Paul's concern for believers. And then Christ's sufficiency is demonstrated in Paul's declaration of the believer's completeness, or maybe better to say, fullness in Christ when a respected New York doctor died his bachelor sons Homer and Langley Collier inherited the family house and estate both sons had college degrees and were now financially secure But but the Collier brothers lived in a manner inconsistent with their material status They lived in almost total seclusion. They boarded up the windows of their house and they padlocked the doors. On March 21, 1947, 
the police received an anonymous phone tip that someone had died in the house. When the police arrived, they were unable to window, and inside they found the corpse of Homer on a bed. The police discovered that the brothers had filled the house with junk. The house was crammed full of broken machinery, auto parts, boxes of things, <coughs> broken down appliances, folding chairs, musical instruments that you couldn't play any music with, rags, assorted odds and ends, bundles of old newspapers, all of it was virtually worthless. An enormous amount of debris blocked the front door. So investigators were forced to continue using the upstairs window until a path could be cleared to the front door. Later, while workmen were hauling away trash, someone found the corpse of Langley. Buried under a pile of rubbish, about six feet away from where Homer had died, and Langley had been crushed to death by a crude booby trap that he had built to protect his precious collection from intruders. The junk removed from the Collier home amounted to more than 140 tons. Although the brothers possessed an inheritance that was sufficient for all of their needs, they lived in unnecessary, self-imposed deprivation. They neglected the abundant resources that were rightly theirs. Here's my question. Are you living in self-imposed spiritual deprivation? Have you filled your life with the junk of this world? Have you neglected the wealth that you possess in your all-sufficient Savior? He alone is the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He is indeed your all-sufficient Savior. He alone is able to fulfill the deepest longings of your heart and to fulfill every spiritual and supply every spiritual resource you need to advance in your Christian life. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for our great Savior. We're thankful that he is indeed all-sufficient. Father, I marvel at the selection of Deuteronomy 18 this morning because there's a list of all kinds of things that your people might have sought after. <laughs> Different ways in which they would try to discover truths. And we find that you pointed them to none other <laughs> That the great prophet who would come, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, he is indeed the one who was sufficient for your people under the old covenant. And he is also the one who's sufficient for us today. We thank you for him. Help us, Father, to draw upon the great resources that we have in Christ, that we would come to him in prayer. And ask for those things that only he can truly give us. That we would come to him recognizing that he is the one who can bless us so richly. Help us pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.